Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being with us this morning um, and joining us for the webinar brought to you by the International Bipolar Foundation. This morning, we have Dr. Rai. Dr. Ray is a full-time psychiatry, psychiatry resident at St. Mary Mercy Hospital in Avonia, Michigan. After graduating from one of the most prestigious medical schools in India, Dr. Ray moved to the U.S. In a brief stint at Mayo Clinic Rochester, he gained firsthand experience in the Department of Psychiatry, after which he joined the Child Psychiatry Unit of New York State Psychiatry Institute, Columbia University and has worked there before joining his residency. Dr. Ray is an active member of American Psychiatry Association. He has a number of med index publications to his credit and has presented several posters and cases on bipolar disorder at international conferences. In addition, Dr. Ray is an active member of and voluntary editor to International Society of Bipolar Disorder and writes regularly for the resident column of ISBD Global. Thanks to his family, Dr. Ray was introduced to yoga as a child and has grown up understanding, practicing, and perfecting the various nuances of asanas, meditation, and spirituality. As an active member of International Bipolar Foundation, he is currently working on the chapter Bipolar Disorder in India and is closely and keenly associated with a promising research group working on yoga and its effects on psychiatric diseases in India. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Debbie. Um, I am Dr. Rai, and today uh, I'll be talking on yoga and mood disorders. Um, we'll be talking about what we know and need to know about effects of yoga on bipolar disorder. Um, my whole talk I have kind of divided into two parts. In the beginning, we would be talking about yoga and then going ahead and seeing how much we have done and what needs to be done in the field of mood disorders. So let's get started. Just a second. Okay. The first slide, is, the picture that you see in the center is a little of personal slide. This is my guru and actually he's a family guru. He lives in an ashram and um, we, me and my dad and our family has been following him for yoga and meditation and whatever I have learned my, my, from my family, we have learned from him. So just a couple of pictures on the side, on the right and the left hand side, giving a view of the ashram. Um, in the bottom is a picture of my cousin and this, the background is of the ashram where we as a kid are introduced to the system of yoga and meditation. And he's just trying to do some of the asanas. And it, it's one of the um, uh, hasta yoga that he's trying to do. And uh, that's how we begin. So just uh, introduction. OK, uh, let's move on to origin of yoga. Before starting with the origin of yoga, I would just want to introduce you to the two eras, which are really common in the Hinduism. The first one was known as Satya Yoga. Sat means truth and yoga means era. So that was a period that was known as Sat Yoga, which was which means a period of truthfulness where there were no sufferings. It was believed that it was all the God prevailed and it was there was no diseases in it and people lived in peace and harmony. It's believed that it was around 26,000 years ago. Later on, that era of Satya Yuga was followed by an era which was called Kala Yuga or the Dark Era. Kal, the, kal, the, mean, the term Kal means dark or bad. When this Yuga came in, it brought with itself a lot of diseases, problems, enmity and hatred. So it is believed that yogis the people who perform yoga at that moment thought of some kind of practice which would take away all these sufferings, sufferings from mental problems, sufferings from health aspect and psychological aspect. And that was a time that the yogis who practice yoga started going to the forest, living all by themselves and developing an art which was known as yoga. 
but really the art came into existence or I would say it gained a structure when one of the guru, his name was Patanjali, he introduced, actually he went ahead, gave a structure to it and wrote down all about the yoga which all these yogis has been practicing from years. Thanks to actually Patanjali that he gave a structure and we started knowing more and more about yoga. The first and the beginning of all the yoga positions or meditation is a seed mantra or the seed term called Om. It's spelled as A-U-M or it can be spelled as Om. On the slide you can see there are two pictures on the top. That's the picture of the Om and the picture at the bottom is actually of uh, the Guru Patanjali who really introduced yoga. Uh, the next slide is from my hometown and it's called, the city is called Varanasi. There are three different, as, three important aspects of this city which is really famous. The first is, it is the oldest city ever known in India. Second, it's the holy city. Um, there is a reason why it's called holy is because it's next to the river Ganges, uh, which is considered the holy city. In olden days, um, when the Kali Yuga was there and there was a lot of hatred and enmity and killing, it was believed that if you have committed something wrong or sin, you need to go ahead and if you take a dip in this river, it was not just taking a dip, it was performing some of the yogas and meditation and asanas, you can get rid of all those sufferings. And as you can see um, the picture, uh, there are a couple of yogis um, who are performing the yoga positions uh, in the river. On the other side of the picture on the top, you can see a couple of kids um, uh, perform sitting and uh, the, the dress that they are wearing is a typical dress that a yogi wears. This culture is still prevalent in the, in, in the city where the kids would go to a school, they would learn about meditation and yoga and they incorporate it from their childhood. These kids, they grow up and then they start enchanting prayers, doing yoga and meditation in order to not to just bring peace to the city or to the country India, but it's to bring peace and to the whole world. Um, the picture in the bottom is just a view of the whole city, um, how it is next to the river Ganges and what are the other things. Okay, let's go on to the, the meaning of the word yoga. So the word yoga is derived from a Sanskrit word called yuj, which means yoke or union. When we say union, it's basically believed to be the union of three things. That's mind, body and spirit. As we already talked about um, the structuring of the yoga which was brought up by the Guru Patanjali um, around 26,000 years ago. So he introduced actually eight limbs of yoga. Uh, when we say the eight limbs of yoga, it was actually the eight steps. As we go on from the lower step to the higher step, the first step is yama, which you can see in the top part. And as we go on into the field of yoga, it moves on to the samadhi, which is the last step of the yoga, which a yogi performs. Yama means universal mo morality. It also refers to restraints. There are other five different aspects of yama which we will be going on, uh, we, we will be discussing about in the couple of next slides. Once you have overcome this phase of yama or you have got over your restraints, you move on to the next step or I would say the next limb of yoga that is known as niyama. Niyama stands for personal observances or it also means regulations. There are certain regulations that our body needs to follow in order to have a control over the niyamas and then go ahead to the asanas or asanas, which is known as body postures. We all are very, very familiar actually with the asanas uh, because what we start with in our day-to-day um, -day yoga classes and training, teaching classes is from the asanas. But I just wanted to bring in this two yama and the niyama thing which we need to 
uh, really keep in mind and I will go with the details of Yamas and the Niyamas, what are these and which we should master, which kind of we are forgetting these days. Um, going ahead from the asanas, once you do the body postures, you move, to, move on to the pranayamas. Pranayamas are the breathing exercises and control of prana. Prana, the term prana means breath. It also refers to the soul. Moving on to the next step is a pratyahara. That's the control of the senses. As we all are aware of the five senses, it's believed when you move on to the pratyahara, you have a better control of your senses of touch, of uh, speaking and vision. And you can better do the next steps of yoga, which are dharana, dhyana, and samadhi. Okay, the next one is a dharana. Dharana is more of knowing yourself, concentrating, cultivating an inner perceptual awareness. Dharana is an intermediate phase which leads to dhyana. Dhyana is a very divine stage which is reached when you do meditation. We'll go into details of dhyana later on, but it's, it's most commonly introduced as a stage of meditation. Next on is the stage, the final stage or the final step of the yoga, which is known as union with divine or samadhi. Okay, this is a pictorial view of the all the eight limbs of the yoga, where I was referring to yamas and I said there are five components of yamas and there are niyamas and there is five components of niyamas. So yamas, which we said is restraints or which we need to follow. So let's let's go into a little bit detail what these yamas are. The first one is ahimsa. Ahimsa means non-harming, which says that we should not harm other people. These are the things which yoga says we need to follow in our life before we move ahead to the upper limbs. Satya, that's the truth. We need to be truthful. Asatya is non-stealing. We should not cultivate a habit of stealing. Second, th uh, sorry, the fourth one is Brahmacharya. It's a stage of where you are more of related to God. The last one is Aparagriha. That's non-holding. Non-holding means you are not keeping things to yourself and just not being selfish. You have to share things and be good to others. Coming on to the other aspect is the Niyamas. So when we say niyamas, that's observances or regulations. Under the niyamas, what we have to do is first socha, which means cleanliness. We have to be clean. The next is santosha, which means contentment. We have to be satisfied or content with whatever we, ha whatever we have in our lives. Moving on to the next is the tapas or zeal for yoga. So it is said that you cannot do yoga unless and until you have a zeal, you have a desire to go ahead and really practice yoga. It cannot be forced on you. The next is swadhyaya, which means self-study. You need to do your self-study and your own homework about yoga before getting into the real world of yoga. And the last one is Ishwar Pranidhana, which means surrender. You need to surrender yourself to God. It could be any God, it could be any power, it could be any divine that you need to surrender. So you need to follow all these 10 aspects and master it before you go ahead to start the asanas, which is the ideal thing that the yoga proceeds into. Then as usual, we move on to the asanas, the pranayamas, the pratyaharas. Once we have um, control over this or we start practicing this over the years, we can move on to the upper limbs, that is dharana and the dhyana, and then moving up to the phase known as samadhi. Uh, the next slide, I have actually taken the sum of the limbs or some of the steps from the yoga, that is asanas pranayamas and the dhyanas. I would want to talk a little bit more about it because um, we usually what we do in today's um, 
generation or today, these days is we start with asanas, we go and we do pranayamas and we do definitely dhyanas. Okay. So, uh, first of all the asanas. The three most common asanas which is used today is are actually hatha yoga. The hatha yoga is the yoga which we usually practice sitting in a position which is usually a sitting position and um, doing different postures with our hand. When we say doing postures with the hand we usually use the fingers. The significance of this is when we use different fingers like if we touch our thumb with our little finger it has a different meaning and different sensation as we all know that there are different nerves from the little finger, the index finger and the big the finger so th which has a def definitely different medical impact. The next asana is the Iyengar yoga which usually uses the asanas of sitting position. It also incorporates in itself actually the breathing exercises, the pranayama and it, to an extent it also include the meditative positions that is dhyana. The third one is Sudarshan Kriya Yoga. Sudarshan Kriya Yoga actually has been widely used and has been found to be very beneficial for bipolar disorder and also for depression. There have been multiple studies. Um, to be precise, there have been five studies which has talked about Sudarshan Kriya Yoga in the benefit from depression and bipolar disorder. But there are the other side of Sudarshan Kriya Yoga which gives you a caution and has brought up the other negative effects which we will be talking in the further slides. Next is the Pranayama. So Pranayama is a Sanskrit word meaning extension of prana or breath or extension of the life force. The word Pranayama actually is a derivative from a sans it's Sanskrit language, it's a Sanskrit word. Prana means life, force or vital energy, particularly the breath and the ayama to extend or draw out. The significance of pranayama is, is, is actually a lot because pranayama is known to awaken kundalinis. Let's get into what exactly kundalinis is, or what is the meaning of the kundalini and how does pranayama really awaken kundalini. When we talk about kundalinis, actually kundalinis are the basis of the yoga, meditation and spirituality. And this kundalini gives us a really clear picture how yoga is helpful for us to take away the medical and the psychological problems away or maybe just give a relief from the medical and the psychological problem. Okay, when we talk about the kundalinis, the exact meaning of kundalini is energy centers. Kundalini is not an anatomic position, it's just believed to be anatomic centers in our body. How does the concept of Kundalini came into existence? What we have got from our scriptures and from our yogis from the past is that the whole world if we see the universe is made of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen be it water, earth or fire or air. It's just a combination of carbon, nitrogen and oxygen. It was believed that we being a part of our whole mother nature, mother universe, we are also made up of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen and hydrogen. And that's how if the world or the universe can have that power, the wind can have a power, the water can have a power, fire can have a power, we do inherit all those power in ourselves and where are these power located or focused it was believed it is the kundalinis or these are the energy sources. So there were seven kundalinis that has been described. As we can see on the picture on the both sides right and the left hand side let's have a look at the pictures together. Let's see the, num the first kundalini the muladhara chakra 
which is if we see on the other part of the picture the location of Mooladhara chakra is just above the anus that's the physical location that's it is believed to be and it's if we see the anatomical or the medical part that's the region of pelvic plexus okay moving on to the next kundalini that's the swadhisthana chakra chakra actually means circle and it's it's believed that these energy sources are in the form of circle so it's named the name is given and then the word chakra is added to it so the location of it is above and behind the genitals moving above the third kundalini or the energy source is the nabhi chakra which is next to the believed to be close to the navel moving above is anhata chakra which is next to the heart or the cardiac plexus the another the physical the other part is that it's close to the right of the physical heart and moving on to the next is the vishuddhi chakra which is next to the carotid plexus and the anatomical part is on the throat moving up is aganya chakra or the medulla plexus and it's between the eyebrows moving up is the final and the last kundalini that is known as shashastra chakra or it's on the top or the crown of the head briefly i would also want to go in a little bit in detail about the different chakras or the kundalinis and see how each of these kundalinis are associated with a psychological or the or the mental part and also associated with a physical or a medical part so if we look at the first kundalini which is the Mooladhara chakra uh, you can see that it if we activate or awaken our first kundalini which is usually done with the help of yoga meditation we can overcome the act of elimination which means taking out waste material from our body that's the lower GI tract or the lower tract intestine and the material drive that we have in our mind drive to take things and worldly possessions we can overcome that moving on to the next the kundalini is the swadhisthana chakra which you can see if you see the physical part of it it is it deals with the reproduction and sensual and sexual drive so once we awaken our kundalinis we can overcome this sexual drive and also the reproduction phase and we can take care of the problems which arises from these regions moving above once you awaken your kundalini to the second level you can move on to the third level with the help of yoga and meditation and this navel or the nabhi chakra is deals with power drive the digestion that is the upper gi tract and it is also the place of a seat of the willpower the psychological part of it is once you awaken this kundalini you can overcome all the problems and it's a phase where you have a strong willpower moving on above is the right of the physical heart or the anhata chakra that is believed to be near the heart and it says that it signifies respiratory system and cardiovascular system and deals with love compassion and drive so once you awaken this you overcome all these physical problems moving on to above is the visuddhi chakra that is at the region of throat and this is the position where once if the yogi or the yoga performer reaches he is above all the physical ailments he will not have any physical problems and he will move on into the stage where he have, will have a spiritual drive and would just work towards getting enlightenment moving on to the next would be between the eyebrows that is aganya chakra which do, deals with intellect and intelligence going further above is the crown of the head or the formless supreme light which we believe is the stage of enlightenment with some of the people like Gautam Buddha he reached and there were others some saints who reached the stage of enlightenment why I went a little bit detail into these um, kundalinis is because that's the basic concept of yoga and this kundalinis is a way to connect between the act of yoga and the physical and the mental problems 
Okay. After the pranayamas, we talked about pranayamas, the asanas. Let's go on to the dhyana. Dhyana is as perceived as just sitting in a position and keeping calm or doing meditation. But to be very precise, when we do dhyana, it's most of doing meditation and the meditator is not aware of the object of meditation around him. Dhyana, as said, is a stage which leads to the final stage of yoga or the samadhi, which in the previous slide we saw as the final stage of crown of head. This is the region of samadhi. Once you reach here, uh, you are in a stage of samadhi where you are not aware of any of your surrounding. You just get connected to the divine power or the God or whatever the final source. Um, the picture on the right hand side is one of the God, Indian God, who is in a, pos in, in, in a dhyana position and doing meditation. Okay, let's, let's get into a little bit of facts from the literature which talks about or which will give us a clear picture that why exactly do we need yoga? If we have medications to treat our depression, if we have medications to treat our bipolar disorders, why yoga? And to be precise, not just yoga, why do we need other psychosocial interventions? When I say psychosocial intervention, I'm talking about other alternative medicine or, te or, or techniques like Zen and other exercises that we practice most commonly or the psychotherapies, um, the behavioral therapies that we incorporate. So uh, I have included a um, recent study which I read was from the WHO in 2000 which came out in 2011 and uh, this study estimated that psychiatric disorders are the leading cost of disability adjusted life years and the figure that they gave was nearly 37 percent loss of healthy years from just the non-communicable diseases were from the mental diseases and actually depression being the number one out of them so if we see all the diseases the depression rank third and if we see just the men mental problems depression was ranked one the next the two facts are pretty interesting when we see uh, the, the next one says that if we look at the percentage of population having insomnia or this, that is not being able to sleep or the sleep problem, it was 9 or 221 percent which is actually a big number because it gives us an idea because sleep problem is a root cause for the other problems of depression and bipolar. Next important inference from the study was that 25% of the adults, they consume sleeping, sleep medication at some point in a year. The study also brought up an interesting point that if a person who is depressed and given a diagnosis of depression uh, according to the DSM and is started on an antidepressant, um, it was believed that for after if a, again the next study was done after a year and the criteria was seen on the DSM 60 percent of the patients were still depressed. Later on the study also talked about how these people when followed over years eventually developed treatment resistance and the study talked about how the new terms are coming up about treatment resistance to depression, treatment resistance to bipolar and actually treatments resistant to schizophrenia which in our common practice we all are aware of and we keep on hearing that oh such and such person is now treatment resistant which means treatment resistant to medications. Um, there was a recent article in American Journal of Psychiatry and it was published actually in October 2013 edition which actually mentioned that in 2020 depression will be the most debilitating and costly disorder on the planet where they compared it actually with other problems of stroke and heart problems and um, lung problems and all the physical problems and they said that with the practice that we are following right now it will in 2020 it would be the most debilitating disorder. Now 
why am I bringing all these up, all these facts? The main aim to bring up all these facts from the different journals and research studies was one thing which we usually as a psychiatrist, we do practice and uh, like in ABCD, the beginning to beginners, we always learn that any of the psychiatric problem or the psychiatric condition is heterogeneous in nature. We very clearly know that it has a biological part to it, it has a psychological part and it has a social origin. Biological is your body, psychological is mind and brain and, and social is how you brought up, how your childhood was and how your social surroundings are right now. But when we are aware of all these three facts and facets of a psychiatric problem, then why are we still dependent just on medication? And all the research things, the details that I just mentioned is clearly reflects that if we just do medication, that's what the result is going to be in the near future. So it really brings into the attention that the psychosocial intervention, that is yoga and other interventions like psychotherapies and behavioral therapies as is widely used and it should be practiced in an alternative interventions. Okay, um, let's uh, see some of the facts about yoga in US. It's, there was a study in, actually a survey in 2008 which talked about 6.1% uh, of the population, that's 15.8 million people are practicing yoga today. And a survey also said that 2008 in, uh, in the same actually survey was 4.1% people, that's 9.4 million, are saying that they will start practicing it in the near future. So this, fa this fact actually clearly draws our attention that if these many people are using yoga without being prescribed by a, medic by a doctor or by an FDA approval, this means there is some fact, some positive aspect which is bringing with this yoga or maybe other alternative med medicines. Okay, let's go a little bit into um, how does yoga works? How does it affect the body and the mind? What is the scientific basis? We did talk about what yoga is and how it is affecting the Kundalini's, which is usually um, the things which has been brought, given to us by our old culture and in books and stuff. Let's go into the different mechanisms that is suggested by various studies and there's been a lot of studies on these mechanisms which have proved that when a person does yoga, there is, first of all, let's talk the first and the second point together is um, reduction, there's a reduction in the sympathetic tone and an increase in the parasympathetic tone. So what's sympathetic tone and parasympathetic tone? Sympathetic tone and a parasympathetic is actually, it helps you deal in a state of stress. When you are in stress, you have increase in heart rate, you are sweating, you are restless. So the sympathetic tone is increased at that time. It was seen in the researches that there is a decrease or reduction in the sympathetic tone once you practice yoga or meditation. There was an increase in a parasympathetic tone and actually parasympathetic tone more of brings the body towards the relaxation phase. Um, the third point is about increasing the release of some of the um, chemicals in the brain, the CNS, which means central nervous system. And it was found out that the level of endorphins, mono means, brain-derived neurotrophic factors were increased in hippocampus. Hippocampus actually is a part of the brain which is involved in learning memory and also into the higher thinking of the brain. The next uh, mechanism was increase in the EEG synchrony. EEG is ele electric electrograph which is actually deals with the brain activities or the brain waves. There was uh, also an increase in the melatonin. The melatonin, as we already know, is secreted by the um, one of the gland in the, in the brain and uh, it helps you with the sleep. And as we know, the basis of all, most of the psychiatric problem, the depression and bipolar, is the sleep. 
rest, it was also seen there is a decrease in the cortisol level from the brain, that is one of the steroid and uh, there is a, there was also an increase in some of the neurotransmitters like serotonin, glutamate, GABA, N-acetylcholine, there was decrease in dopamine and norepinephrine. These are some of the chemi chemi neurotransmitters which we already know has been proved to be increased or decreased in depression and the medications actually that we use these days, they, they actually focus the increase or decrease in the level of the serotonin, glutamate and the GABA. Okay. The next figure uh, is actually a summarization of what we all talked, what we talked right now from the beginning of the slide where the first is yoga, which where we talked about what yoga is. Next we talked about the lens of the yoga, which is reflected here in the picture. Moving on was how the yoga, the different limbs of yoga, they affect the brain that is HPA is a hypothalamus pituitary axis. It is a um, axis in the, in, in the body which, which functions to control the symptoms of the body. Uh, it causes a decrease in cortisol and how it affects the neurotransmitter by increasing some of the neurotransmitters and decreasing the level of some of the neurotransmitters and some of the factors in the brain and also the immune system. The next is how it affects your brain and our heart and how ultimately it really causes a significant change in the, in the symptoms of decrease in depression, decrease in anxiety, decrease in the negative symptoms, increase in cognition, increase in sleep and increase in attention. Okay, this is one of the study which was done at Harvard Medical School um, in a meditating, in a group of meditating people. There were two studies actually done. The first one was a group of people were taken and uh, um, they were made to meditate for eight weeks. Their brain EEG was done and EEG was um, presented, one was taken before um, the meditation process and another one was done after the eight weeks of meditation. So the part where EEG was taken from were from the frontal lobe and as we know the frontal lobe is big in reasoning, planning, emotions and self-conscious awareness. Then the parietal lobe and uh, the, also from the thalamus and the reticular formation. So it was believed that when the meditation or training after the eight weeks, that there were changes in the, in, in, in the wave, waves of, in the mind. Usually there are many waves, the most important ones are alpha, beta and the theta waves. Uh, let's go on to the next slide where it is more clear. Um, so the alpha wave is the relaxed, it, it signifies relaxed and the calmness, the beta waves is actually awakeness in being in conscious and maybe in a little bit of stressful position. So this study showed that before meditation, the people who have mostly showing beta waves. After doing more meditation and yoga, it changed to alpha and theta waves depending, changing from person to person. Alpha is more of relaxed and calm phase and theta is actually a deep relaxation phase. This picture, the first one shows the different lobes of the brain and actually the second shows how there was a change even by one act of meditation, not for eight weeks, but even if one app, you meditate for one time and do yoga postures and then again measure the, the functional MRIs and do the EEGs, this was a decrease in the, the waves in the brain. Okay, so that was the, the medical part. Let's go on to the different forms of yoga. Actually, I have listed a number of yogas and uh, there are different forms of it which uh, we know of and actually um, we practice actually. If I go through them, maybe most of you would be picking up, okay, I do this form of yoga or maybe that form of yoga. Um, they have all different meaning. They are all in different um, beneficial in different aspects. Still, there is a lot, there is not much research about what is beneficial with what problems, but as a whole, what we commonly practice is Ashtanga Yoga, the Hatha Yoga, the Iyengar Yoga, the third one. We commonly practice the Bikram Yoga, which had, which was found out to have some 
side effects which I will be talking about and then um, the other one the Kundalini Yoga, the Kripalu Yoga which is very famous in US and others are the Anusra Yoga and the Tibetan Yoga. Okay, let's go on to the bipolar. Um, so this is a this is a picture talking about just just showing a picture of the bipolar. It's, this was pretty interesting to me about how this female is depressed and there's a little bit of smile, not a smile but a different um, aspect which kind of strike me as a bipolar picture. Okay, uh, the next this is a prescription where as you can say the na see the name is Joe Stress. Um, I just wanted to bring this pres prescription is because this really reflects how we are using yoga in present day. So maybe the diagnosis is stress, the treatment was given was yoga and it was written at least 10 minutes each day and refill was, live, was for lifetime. But is it a valid or it does it make sense? I would say it doesn't make sense right now because if we really look at a prescription, it needs to specify what is the diagnosis, how frequently do we use it, how long do we use it and how many refills are needed or you know like how many times and there should be a clear distinction which is currently not present. Let's go and talk about uh, the Sudarshan Kriya Yoga. So Sudarshan Kriya Yoga is one of the f famous yoga which has been found to be very beneficial for bipolar disorder um, and uh, there are actually three components of the Sudarshan Kriya Yoga. The three components are the Ujjayi, also known as victorious breath, bhastarika or the bellow breath. The last one is Om. So actually Sudarshan Kriya Yoga is very, was at, at there was a time it was strongly recommended for depression and bipolar. Victorious breath is taking two to four breaths per minute. What we do is we just go ahead, take some deep breaths and take the breaths out and it's one minute you have to take two to four breaths which was calming and bring brings a lot of alertness and give calmness to the body. The second part of this was the bhastarika where you do bellow breath where you breathe in and out very rapidly and forcefully and you have to do 30 breaths in a minute which was excitatory and followed by there was a calmness which brought it is something which corresponded with the bipolar pattern. And the third one was enchanting of Om, which was finally followed by a prolonged expiration, taking out of your breath and saying Om in a calm way. So these were the three, three parts of the Sudarshan Kriya Yoga. Now, going on to the next, the cautions of Sudarshan Kriya Yoga, which was found out further later on um, in the bipolar disorder was if a person is having a diagnosis of bipolar 1 or is an unstable rapid cycler, so the Shankriya Yoga did not go well. It made the bipolar, the manic episode more worse and it in increased the frequency of manic episode in the rapid cyclers. So it was asked not to go ahead and do this yoga position. The second was the Bhastarika that is rapid cyclical breathing. It was found out to induce mania which was really um, um, there was a case report which talks about and Bhastarika as we, I already told is the second part of the Sudarshan Kriya Yoga. N moving on it was also found out that bipolar patients may overuse this practice of Sudarshan Kriya Yoga and there was a case report talking about triggering of psychosis. There's a one very important aspect to Sudarshan Kriya Yoga and they say when you do this Sudarshan Kriya Yoga in a bipolar two patients they should be on a mood stabilizer but not lithium. If they are on antipsychotic, it's fine. Why it was said that lithium is not good? Because it was believed that the lithium levels are decreased or the lithium is excreted more if you do the Sudarshan Kriya Yoga because of its effect on the GI tract that we already talked through the Kundalini's. Okay, um, the next it was advised that if you are having any agitation or um, you, you do your yoga, go back home and you're really agitated and not feeling well, it's advisable to stop doing the Sudarshan Kriya Yoga. Okay, here are some of the yoga positions which is effective in bipolar depression, which I would just really fast glance through and would you can have a look at it. Actually, all these positions, there are 14 positions, 18 positions which I have mentioned. Um, these positions to be, uh, are, have been taken from yogajournal.com. If you need to know more about them, you can go ahead and look into that. 
I just wanted to bring in the contraindications and cautions and draw attentions toward it because these are the positions that we do but we forget that oh we had neck injury sometime in our life so we should not do it like dolphin plank pose it should not be done if you have shoulder injuries or neck injuries but it can be done if you use a blast bolster or if you use in the neck injuries some support for forehead on a block so dolphin plank pose easy pose sukhasana they say it's easy but it's not usually easy for people who sit in the chairs so you should not do it if you have some knee injury or maybe talk to your doctor about how to perform these poses there are other feathered peacock pose there are again contraindications and cautions about handstand pose how it is um, contraindicated in back shoulder headache heart conditions blood pressures and menstruation um, there are this is uttasana going ahead is supported shoulder stand this is one of the pose which is very widely used for depression and bipolar but it has some of the contraindications that we should look at and then there is wild thing the next is a corpse pose or the savasana which is a relaxation pose and is really helpful for both insomnia and bipolar dolphin pose um, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about actually the English version there are also the, the Sanskrit version of it um, again the fire log pose contradicted in low back and knee energy um, then the next is head to knee forward bend contradicted in asthma and diarrhea um, so there are poses for insomnia which you can rapidly go through and as I already said if we really want details of these poses we can just go ahead and see the yoga journal.com okay um, there are two evidence which really supports the benefit in bipolar there are no randomized control trials or prospective studies but Mayer et al has found an observational study which really exhibits the effect of yoga on bipolar disorder and Abala Subramaniam et al also did a study of on role of yoga in cognition that is memory and and in sleep there was a um, study done by Levi R et al which studied the effect of yoga on mood in psychiatric inpatient and psychiatric rehabilitation which really showed a tremendous change after before session and after session in all aspects of the psychiatric problem of tension anxiety depression okay um, the, finally I would want to this is actually for me I think it's a very important slide because it talks about risks of yoga therapy in bipolar if you are glancing through this and you see you have any of, of this diabetes mellitus hypertension joint disease prenatal you are a prenatal woman glaucoma retinal detachment risk of blood loss severe spinal stenosis all of these are the comorbidities and can actually make your problems worse if you just go ahead and start practicing yoga without knowing if your yoga position is going to worsen or not monitoring these symptoms okay risk continued is the same that is Sudarshan Kriya Yoga that we talked about I just wanted you to have again a look at it because these are the evidence based thing which has talked about the ill effect of them moving on is now more research is needed for bipolar disorder why more research is needed first research is required to really test the efficacy of yoga in bipolar disorder second research is required to know the different types of yoga or the poses that is will be really efficacious in treating bipolar disorder research is needed to identify for how long do we need to use yoga to practice to get a beneficial effect and the research is also needed to know how many times or frequency of yoga is needed to have a desired effect there are different institutes UCLA in California and there are different actually really Ivy Leagues and other institutes um, I know uh, there is a group in Harvard there is a group in Cooper University who are really working hard on identifying the biomarkers of the of the yoga component like if a person does yoga what is the change in their mind how does the genomic changes how does their magnetic MRI changes what are the changes in the PET scans and how can we correlate this 5,000 year old practice into more practical and a scientific way so that people don't have side effects from it lastly I would say the take home point from this talk would be I would really emphasize on three these three points yoga is a highly individualized form of exercise don't as you take if you take a medication you're taking Paxil it may have a different effect on you I mean as was well the side effects are concerned the other people may not have it so 
it's really individualized you should not go ahead like my friend is doing this pose so let me go ahead and do the same pose second is please share your yoga positions with your doctor your primary care physician if you are bipolar and have a bipolar diagnosis you need to share your you can go ahead and do the positions looking at the at online but before starting it do let your primary care physician know and let them know the side effects so that they can regularly monitor you for the side effects last is we should keep in mind that yoga is not an alternative for medication it's just an adjunct intervention it is taking care of other parts which is not being taken care of by the medication I would like to end my talk here and uh, the questions are welcome thank you thank you dr. Ray um, now we are open for questions. Okay, um, it looks like you've answered all of our questions, Dr. Ray. Just mm -hmm. wanted to say thank you so much for the presentation. Oh, mm. wait, one has just come in. <laughs> Do you recommend starting for very brief stints to teach others the breath work? Okay, um, first of all, we need to know that why the breath stints or the breath exercises is being for what reason if it's just for the relaxation phase uh, parts I would say it's always beneficial to go to a yoga teacher and and learn it because when you do the breath exercises it's not just breath taking in and out as we already talked in the slides it takes into account concentration attention sitting in a perfect posture and then taking the breathing in and out and that's how it makes a difference to your mind and it gives a better effect and actually a better result for the relaxation. Okay, thank you. Um, the same. Is the doctor in the prescription pad that you had on the screen, is that someone in San Antonio that actually prescribes yoga? Uh, actually, too, I just picked it up from the from Google. And as I believe there's nobody who does that because that's not approved. And it's, yoga is not FDA approved. You cannot go ahead and do it. It's, it was just, a, it's, I think it was just kind of a satire. And I wanted to bring that in that. I would highly recommend this. This is not the practice. Nobody really prescribes yoga right now. Like as far as I know the psychiatric, we can prescribe it verbally, but we don't give a prescription for yoga. So that, that would be my answer from a, a psychiatric fraternity and as much as I know. Thank you. Next question. What if you have a hard time shutting down your mind? Okay, yeah, that's actually a very interesting question. Um, I would say if you are having a hard time shutting down your mind, don't sit in the posture, don't do yoga, don't don't start enchanting words, don't play music and force yourself. As I said, one of the component of yoga was having a zeal, a desire, unless and until you don't have it. And that's you know that's what I I think that all the yoga centers in California and all over actually state United States is doing a good work. Go ahead talk to one of the yoga teacher, go, join a group. When you are in a group, it would make it really easy for you to bring relaxation and calmness to your mind and definitely see a psychiatrist if there is some problem going on because maybe medication could facilitate going ahead and performing yoga and the act of yoga and the whole postures of yoga and then once you feel it, I'm sure that you would definitely be benefited. So in a nutshell, it would be three parts. 
first definitely see your doctor if there is really a problem get a diagnosis made then incorporate yoga if you're not able to do it yourself maybe you why don't you take a help of a trained person like a yoga teacher or a center great thank you next question how many psychiatric doctors would really know about the positions of yoga and what they do uh, um, uh, how many people know I really don't have an answer to that um, but I think if I how I have been trained and I am right now training and I think if I bring this up it's more of a self-awareness if I bring this up to one of any of the doctors they really listen to it and they, 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 they really incorporated but he, that's right and actually you know they are justified not um, really getting into our prescribing or, or knowing about the yoga positions is one reason is because it's not FDA approved there's not much research done um, it's something which is right now abstract and more of used for giving calmness and relaxation to the body but really I would I'm, I'm really enthusiastic to let you know that in coming years there's a lot of being done there's a lot being done in UCLA and other big institutes which are really working hard to specify yoga positions and there are a lot of PET scans and MRIs and, and, and other techniques being used into it to actually specify a yoga position and give its beneficial effect side effect as we just do for different medications like okay if you take Paxil you will have these these, these side effects so that's what they are working on um, but it would take years but um, I think then the psychiatrist would know about it and uh, would be comfortable prescribing it great thank you what type of types of yoga do you recommend for a bipolar 2 diagnosis in a patient who is not currently on meds? Uh, okay, so if a person is not on meds, um, I would say the first recommendation would be to go and see a psychiatrist and uh, get, uh, get, get started on meds if the psychiatrist needs and if he thinks that the person is. And as I said that you should definitely not do Sudarshan Kriya Yoga there are other list of yoga position that I mentioned which you can see the 18 positions which are beneficial but then again when you do do, the, do those position I would say if, 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 if you ask me right now again there's no research there is nothing specific that this works but just the core position where you lie and relax that's something which has been shown to be beneficial and the shoulder head position where you just lie on your shoulder and the legs up these are the two positions that has been actually I have read literature about being effective and then definitely the Sudarshan Kriya Yoga it's these three are really beneficial for bipolar 2 but just make sure that you're not on lithium if you are on lithium um, that would be difficult with the Sudarshan Kriya Yoga because they say that it increases the execution of lithium so definitely these three poses but this is again the something which our yoga teachers have given us from years this uh, there's nothing FDA approval or, 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 or exact research done in this field but from my side I would recommend that thank you which type of yoga do you recommend for beginners? Okay, so for the beginners, um, definitely, uh, I would say start from the asanas that usually people do. Um, asanas, definitely, people think that, okay, I have this shoulder thing and I want to do be flexible, but I would want to bring into you, you know, that's, this is a, one of the saying from my, from my guru that I was trained with and actually from my family is trained with, he says, start with the easiest thing that you can do just sit in a posture meditate and try to relax your mind that's the, that's the, the that that's the beginning of the asanas that's a sitting posture or um, the normal posture which is begin with that if you start feeling that you are getting benefit from it then move on to the another ones to the pranayamas or the dhyanas but i would say pranayamas or dhyanas need really rigorous like a years of experience start with the sanas 
if you, you get benefit from the asanas, then you can move ahead to the next level where the, 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 the pranayamas, that the breathing exercises and dhyanas come. The one thing which I would really like to recommend, don't start with pr the pranayama, the breathing exercises. Somebody tells you, oh, if you do the breathing exercises, your sinus problems will be gone. Don't, don't, please don't try it because the, as we study, there's a limp, there are steps towards the different poses and postures and ultimate level of yoga which leads to samadhi. We don't have to go to samadhi level, that's something which the spiritual gurus and they do, but start from asanas, move on to pranayamas, and, and you know it will drive you. Once you start feeling it, it will drive you to pranayamas and further apart. So start with asanas. Thank you. Is it known why SKY may decrease lithium levels? Yeah, the only thing which is which was known there was a series of lithium. It, it was actually um, a case series of uh, five cases where they saw that they monitored actually the lithium levels. They say when you do the rapid, the bhastarika pose, uh, which is the rapid breathing, what it does is actually increase the motility of your intestines. By increasing the motility of the intestine, what it does, it also has an effect on the kidney as actually lithium is also is excreted from the kidneys, uh, it increases the metabolism of kidney. And there, that's how the kidney gets, the, the lithium get excreted faster than it is usually done in a normal person and the lithium level goes down and a manic phase could be trigger, triggered. That's what was referred in the um, uh, case report or what was referred in the study that was done. Thank you. Would yoga, as you have described today, be harmful to rapid cyclers? Yes, uh, I think the yoga, the, the, um, not I think actually that's what the two case reports have have shown, that rapid cyclers, that's more than three or four of the manic episodes if you're ha having in a year, don't do Sudarshan Kriya Yoga. Try to be away from the pranayamas, the fast breathing exercises. Because we think we are breathing, but when we are really doing the pranayamas, we are doing the fast breathing, we are sending messages to our brain. By sending messages, I mean that we are increasing the level of the different neurotransmitters. We are, we, we are changing the levels of the, the neuroconduction in the brain, which to be to, to now is really not understood. The research has been done, but it sends signals and neuroconductions to the brain and it activates, it excites the brain, it increases the level of the neurotransmitters which excites the brain and it could be harmful. So for the rapid cyclers, I would definitely say be, talk to your psychiatrist, try to control your rapid cycling with medication and then move on to yoga once you are stabilized. Great, thank you. And that will be at the end of our webinar today. Thank you all for joining us, and thank you, Dr. Wei, as well. Yep, thank you, everyone. Thanks.